So harnessing epigenetics to improve horticultural crops is my topic today. What I'm going to do is to give you a little uh, background to um, the epi epigenetics, at least insofar as it is relevant to what I'm going to be talking about today. And then I'll move from that into uh, some uh, thoughts about how one can exploit epigenetics uh, for crop improvement. So the essence of what I'm going to be talking about is a process known as RNA silencing. Uh, so this is a process that is common to animals and plants. And it is basically, uh, as implied in the name, a gene silencing mechanism. But it's um, an unusual gene silencing mechanism in that it operates in a sequence-specific manner. Uh, so the reason why it operates in a sequence-specific manner because the, is because the engine at the heart of RNA silencing, illustrated here, a, a ribonuclear protein, has a guide RNA as its specificity determinant. So the effector protein of RNA silencing is known variously as argonaut or slicer, and the small RNA that is the um, uh, specificity determinant is bound, not quite as is shown here, um, to the uh, argonaut protein. And it guides the argonaut protein in a cell so that when it finds a complementary RNA, so the specificity is determined by base pairing between the small RNA and its target, when it finds a complementary RNA, the nuclease function of the argonaut protein can degrade the complementary RNA, or at least that's the simplest uh, iteration of, um, of, of, uh, of, of RNA silencing. Now, a lot of the early work on RNA silencing was done in transgenic plants and in virus-infected plants. But what we've come to appreciate uh, over the last several years is that um, within genomes uh, of plants and animals, there are many loci, many endogenous loci that are nothing to do with viruses or transgenes uh, that produce uh, the small RNAs um, that are the guide of the RNA silencing machinery. So if you look at a typical Arabidopsis chromosome, for example, uh, you find that the loci, this is the distribution of the loci uh, from the centromere to the telomere of an Arabidopsis chromosome. And there are many thousands of these loci. Uh, there's some enrichment in the pericentromeric zone, and that's because sometimes these uh, elements are associated with transposons. But the point is that they're distributed along the length of the chromosome. So there are many loci, many, many of these small interfering RNAs associated with RNA silencing uh, produced in the genomes of plants. A lot of recent work as well uh, has pointed towards um, the uh, diversification of RNA silencing pathways in plants. So this illustrates uh, something from Arabidopsis. Uh, the lettering's a little small, and I don't think you need to deal with the detail here. Uh, the point to note is that uh, many of the proteins, so these are the little circles on, um, on, on this diagram here, that are associated with RNA silencing are encoded by multi-gene families. And what this means is um, that there is the potential for several different types of RNA silencing pathway. So there are some of them involving hundreds of endogenous loci um, that are involved in regulating gene expression um, at the post-transcriptional level. But the most prevalent of these pathways uh, is um, associated with uh, uh, transposons, thousands of loci in the genome, uh, many of which are associated with transposons. And as I'll talk a, a little bit later, uh, this variation on the silencing pathway rather than being associated with post-transcriptional regulation, so regulation at the RNA level, it's associated with regulation at the chromatin level, associated with epigenetic mechanisms that I'll talk about later. So this then is the basic molecular biology of RNA silencing. Uh, lots of RNA silencing going on in plants associated with endogenous elements within the genome. Now, in connection with what I'm going to talk about today, there are two features um, of RNA silencing pathways uh, that are influencing my thinking, at least, about um, where we might go with this. 
And to illustrate these, I'm just going to show you a couple of experiments. Uh, so this is the first experiment. It's one that we did several years ago. Louise Jones um, did this experiment when um, she was in my laboratory in, in Norwich. And uh, this is an experiment uh, using viruses. Uh, so using virus-induced gene silencing. So we discovered very early on that when plants get infected with viruses, um, the viral RNA is copied into these small interfering RNAs, and that then primes the RNA silencing machinery. So it's part of the virus defense machinery that plants have. And we started using this as an experimental tool. So what we were doing was um, taking a virus and inserting into it fragments of host genes of endogenous genes. And in the experiment I'm going to describe to you, the endogenous gene that has been inserted into the virus is GFP. This is just for illustrative purposes. So the GFP virus is then inoculated onto a GFP transgenic plant, and you see what happens. In this experiment that Louise did, we wanted to ask, well, OK, we, we thought we knew what would happen if we put the coding sequence of GFP into the virus. The GFP would be silenced. But we said, well, what happens if we take the promoter, the adjacent sequence in the DNA, uh, and we introduce that into the virus as RNA? What is going to happen then? And the next slide illustrates what happens. So these are the leaves of the GFP transgenic plants illuminated under UV light. This is the control. This is the leaf of the plant infected with the GFP coding sequence virus, the GFP is silenced. So you're looking at red chlorophyll fluorescence here. But here's the experiment um, with the promoter sequence. The GFP sequence was silenced again. So what this told us was this was the first, let's say, one of the early indicators of the link between um, RNA silencing and events at the chromatin level. Uh, so uh, Louise demonstrated that associated with this silencing, the promoter DNA of the GFP transgene was getting methylated. It was getting modified by uh, methylation. So this was sort of interesting enough. But what was even more interesting was when Louise collected seed from these plants and what happened, asked what happened in the progeny. Well, in the progeny of this plant, the silencing, these are little seedlings here, again under UV light, the, and and uh, in this part of the experiment, these uh, progeny um, uh, lost the silencing in the next generation. And that's what we expected, because the virus is not uh, inherited from one generation to the next. But with these plants here, um, the silencing effect persisted from one generation to the next. And um, so this uh, was telling us that we were getting an epigenetic mutation, sometimes abbreviated as an epi mutation. And just summarizing what was going on here, there was uh, an interaction between the virus and the promoter uh, that we now know is mediated by these small interfering RNAs. And it results in the introduction of uh, methyl groups onto the cytosine residues of the promoter. And these methyl groups persist through mitosis and through meiosis. So the importance of this is, and the virus is, as I say, not inherited into the next generation. So it indicates that we've got a two-stage process here. We've got a process in which the establishment of the epigenetic effect, the initiation, uh, requires the RNA, the small RNA. It doesn't require an enzyme in the plant known as the maintenance methylase. But then we've got a second stage in the whole process where the little small RNAs are now no longer present. Uh, but uh, this maintenance methylation enzyme is. So we've got two stages, separate establishment or initiation and maintenance um, in this whole effect. But the point is that these epigenetic effects, once they're initiated, uh, you no, 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 lo no longer need the initiator to be present, but they will be maintained, and they'll be maintained through um, several generations. So this is the first bit that you need to know about RNA silencing in order to uh, uh, grapple with what I'm going to talk to you about later. The second early observation that we made about RNA silencing was that the effects can spread from cell to cell. Um, and um, uh, so this was again illustrated on GFP transgenic plants, and this was work done many years ago now by a very talented uh, PhD student in my lab, Olivier Voinet. 
Uh, and what Olivier did was to express a GFP transgene transiently on one of the lower leads of the GFP plant. So you've got a resident GFP transgene in the plants, and he was ectopically additionally expressing another GFP transgene just on one leaf of the plant. So in this one leaf of the plant, the silencing effect was initiated, but then it spread um, through the vascular system of the plant, out of the main vein, out of the minor veins, and eventually it spread through the whole plant. Um, and uh, uh, the whole plant then got silenced. And this is one of my favorite images here. This is the epidermis of this leaf. And you can see the stomatal guard cells. And they're unsilenced. And that's because the stomatal guard cells are symplastically isolated. They don't have plasma dermatal connections between them and the rest of the epidermis. So the signal of silencing can't get in. Um, uh, so nice illustration of how the signal moves through the um, plasma desmata. So uh, we've got a signal of RNA silencing. And what we've been trying to do for the last decade or so subsequent to these experiments is to work out um, what the um, signal might be. So the first thing we did was to set up a mutant screen uh, asking, could we identify genes in which the spread of the silencing signal was compromised? And indeed, we could. Now, there was a bit of a surprise uh, uh, from that analysis, because what it showed us uh, was that the um, uh, silencing pathway, and I'm not going to go through the details of this. They don't really matter. What it showed us was that the um, spread of the silencing signal was associated with the proteins that we had previously implicated in the epigenetic variation of these RNA silencing pathways. So this was then linking epigenetic effects to the spread of the silencing signal. The problem with the genetic analysis was that there's no spatial information there. So we'd identified all of these genes, some of which were associated with the epigenetic silencing pathway. We knew they were required for the silencing effect, but we didn't know in which cells they were required. Were they operating in the cells in which the signal is produced? Were they acting in the cells in which the signal is being translocated uh, from the source to the recipient cell? Or were they acting in the recipient cells? So we didn't know. In order to um, uh, look at that, uh, what we did uh, was some uh, grafting experiments. And we are very grateful to uh, Colin Turnbull, who I think you've got coming on your seminar program at some point, who developed a very nice set of grafting techniques that you can use in Arabidopsis. You can probably understand that Arabidopsis is not that nice for uh, grafting. But anyway, um, uh, Colin and others had developed grafting protocols that we could use. And the idea was then um, to say, well, um, could we use grafting in order to um, detect uh, movement of a silencing signal. And the approach would be to, um, we were actually looking at shoot to root grafts in this um, particular set of experiments, because we knew the silencing signal moves from photosynthetic source tissue to the photosynthetic sink. Uh, and uh, for technical reasons with Arabidopsis, uh, if you're following movement from source to sink, it's easier to look from uh, uh, shoot to root rather than uh, within the shoot. So the, the approach here is simply to take um, uh, shoots and roots um, that are genetically distinct. So the idea is, um, if you see a silencing signal in the root um, that has got the genetic identity of the shoot tissue, then this is an RNA that must have moved from um, the uh, shoot to the root. So that was the uh, basic approach. And um, the innovation that we introduced into our experiments, so we tried actually grafting experiments uh, with Nicotiana species uh, when we, uh, Olivier first described the silencing signal. But the techniques that we had available to us at that time to detect mobile RNA uh, were not adequately sensitive. And what we've done more recently is to use next generation Illumina sequencing uh, as admittedly a very costly but a highly sensitive way of picking up uh, very low abundance RNAs. Um, it also, because you're looking at the sequence, uh, you've got the genetic resolution so you can easily identify um, sequences that, as I say, have the genetic identity of the shoot uh, present in the root. 
it is enormously sensitive. You can, um, with current variations, you can look at RNA that is present in a population at less than one part in 10, to 10 million. So it's, it's a very sensitive approach. Using this approach, uh, we were able to show indeed um, that RNA was moving from the shoot to the root, and we were able to show that the mobile form of the RNA uh, was actually the small interfering RNA, the, the, the 20 odd nucleotide species that I showed you at the beginning uh, was associated with the um, uh, argonaut protein. And indeed we were also able to show uh, that the type of RNA that was moving uh, was the type of small RNA that we had previously identified as being associated with the epigenetic uh, pathways. So this was bringing together very nicely the grafting analyses with the um, genetic analyses that we had um, done. And this is uh, just quickly going over one of the experiments that we did uh, that I think illustrates quite nicely what is going on here. So we were using, as you can see, we like using GFP as a reporter um, for uh, various stuff here. So we used in these experiments um, a target gene um, that had GFP driven by a meristem specific enhancer. And the silencer in these experiments was a transgene uh, and it was designed to produce uh, small RNA that would target the, uh, the promoter, uh, the meristem specific promoter. And um, I'm not sure under this illumination whether or not you can see it very well, but anyway, this is the control experiment. Uh, so there's a GFP illumination uh, that you can just about see in the roots containing the target gene. Um, these are roots containing the target gene onto which we have grafted um, the uh, shoots containing the silencer transgene. The GFP is lost um, and the GFP RNA is lost. And so not only are we getting uh, movement of small RNA, we're also getting silencing of the target gene. So this RNA that moves actually does something when it gets to where it's going. And this is a point that is emphasized. Again, this is, uh, let's say, a bit of technical detail, and I'll just talk you through it um, without uh, uh, going through all of the points. This is basically um, a, an analysis of DNA methylation. And so what we're looking at here is in the transgene, um, uh, in the presence of the target alone, uh, there's very little methylation uh, in the promoter sequence. Uh, in the uh, tissue that has the target transgene that has been grafted on to uh, plants with the uh, uh, silencer transgene, we now get a massive increase in the methylation of the promoter DNA. And this is just a genetic control. We used in this experiment uh, the, uh, a genotype that had a mutation in the enzyme that makes the small RNA. So, uh, and now we don't get the methylation. So this is demonstrating absolutely conclusively that small RNA that moves uh, uh, does silencing and mediates DNA methylation when it gets to where it's going. So this then takes us to uh, our understanding of mobile silencing. Uh, so, uh, um, and just going through these points here, we've got uh, movement of RNA silencing goes from photosynthetic source to photosynthetic sink. Uh, the recipient tissue uh, is the meristem of the receiving root um, in these experiments. Um, uh, I should add that in other plants, when one can do these grafting experiments, uh, you can also see movement of the silencing signal to the shoot meristem. So it is indeed a photosynthetic source to sink gradient that is being followed here. And although these illustrations are with roots, uh, one can also think about uh, movement of uh, signal in shoots. And the movement of the RNA silencing uh, has got uh, something to do uh, with the epigenetic mechanisms um, here. So obviously I know there's a big interest here in rootstocks and so when one's thinking about the communication uh, between the shoot and the root um, then perhaps uh, uh, one would want to uh, incorporate thinking about the mobile silencing um, into uh, your thinking as to how that communication might operate. So just um, 
This is the, ne the, the next couple of slides just summarize what we know about this epigenetic RNA silencing pathway. It just goes into a little more detail. Um, and the point of all of this is just to show you, first of all, that we have a fairly detailed uh, mechanic mechanistic understanding of what is going on. So what we know is that DNA is transcribed by a special type of polymerase to make initially single-stranded RNA. And that is then copied by an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase into double-stranded RNA. And then there's an enzyme known as DISA um, that generates small interfering RNAs um, associated with this epigenetic silencing pathway. And these epigenetic small RNAs are characteristically 24 nucleotides long. So this is a little molecular detail that differentiates the other silencing pathway RNAs that are 21. And what happens then is that these small RNAs associate with organal proteins, as I showed you in the earlier slides. And the uh, complex then is able to target the DNA and introduce the methylation um, at the DNA sequence, the, the, the methylation. Now, there's a bit of a mystery initially as to how it is um, that a single-stranded RNA associated with an organal protein uh, could target something happening at the DNA level, because we normally think of DNA um, uh, as being a rather closed, uh, uh, double-stranded, uh, double helix uh, that wouldn't be readily available for interaction with an RNA molecule. What we now know is that the targeting mechanism is actually um, an RNA targeting mechanism. So you have another polymerase that is transcribing the target RNA. And the argonaut protein bound to the small RNA is not actually targeting the DNA. It's targeting the RNA that is bound to this polymerase. And then this um, argonaut protein um, then brings the uh, DNA modification, the DNA methyl transferase to its location and mediates the epigenetic modification. Now what happens is that um, uh, well, so this is a pathway then. Um, so this is uh, um, uh, what is going on here. And I, I don't think I need to make any more points about this other than, as I say, to uh, convey to you that we have a fairly detailed understanding of the mechanisms here. It was then a bit of a shock uh, when we started to sort of reconcile our understanding of the plants. You know, that's the trouble with us molecular biologists. Sometimes we lose track of the plants that we're dealing with. And I think that had been true in this whole field because um, when we started looking, what we found was that the plants that were mutant uh, for any of these genes here in this, in this whole pathway, um, the plants actually looked pretty fine. Uh, they, were, uh, they grew and they developed uh, pretty much as did the wild-type plants. Um, the susceptibility to stresses and diseases was not that different from uh, that of the wild-type plants. So you start asking yourself the question, we've got this rather sophisticated, deta um, detailed understanding of this pathway. Are we looking at something that is just a complete artifact, um, or are we just looking in the wrong way? And we thought uh, eventually that we were looking in, in the wrong way. And the evidence that made us think we were looking in the wrong way started off with actually an experiment that we should have done all along. So we said, OK, we know that these 24 nucleotide small RNAs uh, are associated with the epigenetic silencing pathway. When in the life cycle of these plants are they most abundant? The answer was that they were most abundant, massively abundant, in the developing seed. Just a few days after fertilization, uh, that these, these RNAs accumulate to very high levels um, in uh, the seed of the, uh, of, of the plants. What was um, also um, interesting about this analysis was that we found the small RNAs were in the seed only produced from the maternal genome and not from the paternal genome. Now, this was at a time when protein coding genes uh, were being expressed from both the maternal and the paternal genomes. And we also thought they were probably particularly abundant um, in the uh, endosperm. So this then got us thinking about roles of the small RNAs, not so much in growth and development uh, and in responses to external stimuli, including pathogens and stresses, but 
got us thinking about um, inter involvement of the small RNAs, let's say, in interactions between genomes. Uh, because that's what's happening at this time of development of the plant. The two genomes that have been brought together by fertilization are interacting with each other. And there's evidence um, from uh, a number of uh, studies of all sorts of interactions that are going on. So there's a whole um, set of evolutionary biologists who think about parental genome conflict, uh, particularly in the endosperm, uh, and how um, uh, it is in the interest of the maternal genome uh, to limit resource allocation to all of the uh, offspring seeds uh, so that they all survive and so that the maternal plant actually survives um, itself. You might think about some metaphors here for human biology that could be um, explored. Whereas the interest of the paternal genome is simply that any one offspring that is fortunate enough to have that particular uh, paternal genome in it um, it should be um, uh, promoted. And actually supporting this whole parental genome conflict idea, um, there's evidence indicating that maternal genomes produce suppressors of seed development, paternal genomes uh, produce enhancers of seed development. Uh, some of the work that uh, supports that idea uh, comes from Rod Scott in Bath, uh, and it's based on doing interploidy crosses. So if you um, uh, cross tetraploids and diploids of um, Arabidopsis, uh, Rod's work that has been replicated by others um, shows that if you use the tetraploid um, as the maternal parent, um, the seed are smaller uh, than in the wild type, so consistent with you know, the excess maternal dosage producing a suppressor. Uh, whereas if the uh, uh, tetraploid is the paternal parent, then the seeds are larger, so consistent with the idea that maybe the paternal genome is producing an enhancer of seed development. And we've actually followed this up in a collaboration with um, Jeffrey Chen from the University of Texas, uh, and this work was published last year in PNAS. And it's very consistent with the idea that endosperm-derived um, small RNAs uh, 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 can affect the expression of um, transcription factors that are repressors of um, seed development. So you've got uh, small RNAs from the maternal genome being repressors of a repressor. Uh, so um, when you have um, these small RNAs being produced, um, you uh, uh, remove the repression of the repressor, and so you repress and so you get small seeds. Um, whereas when these small RNAs are not being produced, for example, in a mutant um, in the epigenetic silencing pathways, you get um, larger seeds. So this is a work in progress, as it were. I think there's more to come out of this. Uh, but it just, uh, let's say, illustrates uh, one facet of the potential role of these small RNAs influencing seed, side, seed size um, uh, in seed development. But this then got us thinking a little more um, about um, uh, a role of um, small RNAs, particularly transposon-derived small RNAs. And we've, as a working hypothesis, uh, we're uh, using this idea that maybe the transposon-derived small RNAs allow genomes to define themselves as self. And so uh, when you make a hybrid uh, between two genomes, particularly if you do an interspecific cross, uh, what you might imagine is that the self-identifying small RNAs from one of the two genomes that go into the cross will have an effect on the other genome and vice versa. And um, uh, we uh, developed this hypothesis. I mean, this is a sort of graphical representation of the hypothesis. Uh, so the idea is that, let's say, genotype A that goes into a cross produces a small RNA that finds a target um, in genotype B. And so when you make the hybrid, um, what will happen is that um, uh, as a consequence of this small RNA being produced, um, this uh, gene, this target gene uh, in genotype B will be silenced in the hybrid, uh, whereas it won't be silenced um, in uh, this parental genotype. What I haven't taken you through, but this is part of our let's say, understanding of RNA silencing mechanisms is that sometimes when a gene is targeted by RNA silencing, it produces secondary small RNAs. And then 
these secondary small RNAs can either feed back and reinforce the silencing of the primary target, but they can also act in trans and find secondary targets as well. And so based on our understanding of the RNA silencing mechanisms, we were hypothesizing that one could get regulatory cascades initiated in hybrids uh, that we wouldn't see in the parents. So this then brought us to tomato. So tomato, um, for various reasons, is a much better species with which to do this type of analysis. So you can make homoploid interspecific um, crosses with tomato in a way that you can't do uh, with Arabidopsis species. And also, I figured that um, tomato is actually uh, a very interesting plant for a, a lot of different reasons. So we were able to exploit uh, for this analysis uh, some hybrids that had been made many years ago by Danny Zamir and his colleagues in Israel, actually as part of an um, e Egypt-Israeli peace initiative in the 1980s, I believe. Uh, and so what Danny had made uh, was uh, a, a series of hybrids between uh, cultivated and wild tomato. Uh, and he had derived a series of introgression lines, actually a whole set of introgression lines. Um, so these were essentially tomato, but each different line had got a small part of the wild tomato genome introgressed into it. So you got a whole set covering the, the whole of the um, tomato genome. And what we were doing in these analyses, where the, our first level of analysis was to say, well, could we see small RNAs in the hybrids that we could not see in the parents? And we could. Uh, so here's one example. Um, so these are, this is the abundance of small RNAs at one particular locus in the F parents, in the F1s and the F2s, various integration lines. But you can see in this integration line here, um, small RNAs from this particular locus go through the roof. And look at the axes, it's broken here. So we've got thousands here and almost none in the other genotypes. So we've got massive amplification in this hybrid of production of small RNAs from this locus. What does this locus encode? It encodes phenylalanine ammonia lyase, very important enzyme in uh, secondary metabolism of plants involved in uh, secondary metabolites associated with disease, uh, lignin production, and so on and so forth. So um, the, these are just data um, illustrating that uh, indeed uh, the phenylalanine ammonia lyase expression is greatly reduced in this integration line and not in the others. And when we use this um, histochemical stain for lignin, uh, we see in this line uh, that lignin is essentially absent, um, whereas it's abundant in all of the other lines that we've looked at. So this is very strong evidence here um, that indeed, as we predicted, uh, we're getting um, silencing happening in hybrids that does not happen in the parents. We see this at um, uh, many other loci. So uh, looking at the selection of genotypes that we have scanned, we see evidence where we call this transgressive small RNA production because it transgresses the uh, limits established by the parental genotypes. We see it happening at, um, at other loci. So this is, again, one of these genome plots looking at a particular locus, and we're looking at the abundance of small RNA. And this is a control, if you like. So uh, in this example here, we got small RNA in one parent, not in the other. The F1 has an intermediate uh, amount. All of the other lines um, have uh, the tomato parent level, and that uh, with the exception of these. And these um, have the Penelii genome, so um, uh, in that region of the genome. So this is as you would expect. But um, this is now looking at 100 or so loci, illustrating the various loci at which we see evidence for the transgressive effects. And I just want to, uh, so this is a heat map where blue indicates few small RNAs. Uh, so each line across is a separate small RNA locus, and each column uh, is a separate genotype of plant. Um, so um, here you've got a small RNA that is abundant in these lines uh, and not in the parents because it's red and the parents are blue. I want to bring your attention to this one locus here, uh, which happens to be abundant um, at all of the 
um, lines that we looked at, uh, but not at the parents. And this just shows another representation here, a genome browser shot. Small RNAs abundant in the introgression lines, not in the parents. Interestingly, they don't appear as we predicted they would in the F1 hybrid. Um, they begin to appear in the F2 and later generations. So there's something going on here um, that we didn't understand, but linked to, in this particular instance, the transgressive appearance of the small RNAs, there is methylation of the corresponding DNA. So this is an assay we use for um, DNA methylation. Uh, so the parental lines relatively unmethylated, uh, but the introgression lines and the F2s um, highly methylated at this particular DNA locus. So what we've got here is transgressive silencing in interspecific <laughs> hybrids. So I think this is something to think about when one's doing breeding. So we normally think about you know, combinations of genes and genetic markers, uh, but maybe what we should be thinking about uh, are looking, as well as at genetic markers, looking at epigenetic markers and trying to correlate um, uh, phenotypes with um, epigenetic effects. It also, well, it also uh, emphasizes another feature that I don't think has been fully appreciated. So we all know about hybridization and how hybridization is it's, it's what breeders do, right? They, they uh, breed genotypes of plants. And we always think about what the, uh, uh, the outcome of the breeder's work is providing new combinations of genes. Uh, but I think what our work is illustrating, particularly from the second locus that I showed you there, is that the process of hybridization is actually generating new heritable variation. It's epigenetic variation, but it's heritable nevertheless. And if it's heritable, um, then it's potentially um, useful. And I think it then prompts us um, to start looking at phenotypic variation in uh, the crops that we work with um, to ask to what extent um, are the useful phenotypes correlated with um, epigenetic as opposed to um, genetic marks. So these are some questions uh, that one might ask then about natural epi, epi mutation, as I've just summarized. What I want to do just in the last uh, few minutes of my talk is to talk about targeted epi mutation. So if one has um, uh, evidence for uh, natural epi mutation um, that is heritable and associated with traits, um, then can we use our understanding of RNA silencing to actually um, target epi mutations. As you know, targeting genetic mutations is not a routine process, although it may be getting easier these days. But maybe we could target epi mutations. So um, targeted um, uh, uh, epi mutation. Uh, so in, if, if one's going to have um, artificial or targeted epi mutation, what you would need to do uh, is to have a protocol um, for delivering a small RNA that is targeted to a promoter of interest. And in, let's say, a hypothetical scenario, let's say you've got a gene that is adversely affecting the quality of the fruit that you're interested in. What you'd like to do is to silence or knock down the expression of them. So perhaps uh, by introducing the um, uh, small RNAs into these plants, one could target the uh, epi mutation to the promoter of that gene uh, so that in the progeny of the plant in which you'd carried out this man manipulation, um, the gene uh, was indeed um, uh, uh, silenced. And so the, the phenotype of the plant would be improved. So how would you do this? What would be the delivery method for the silence of small RNA? Well, I think one can think of several. Uh, I showed you some experiments early on uh, on the Cotiana species where one used a virus. Um, you could use a, a transgenic strategy, so you could cross in, let's say, a silencer transgene, uh, use the um, silencer transgene to affect the introduction of the epi mutation, and then cross out the silencer transgene so that you're then uh, left with a plant that doesn't have a transgene in. Uh, the, the scenario that I want to describe to you now uh, involves um, uh, using grafting to deliver the small RNA. So this is a, a grafting strategy. 
so how to make an epigenetically modified plant. So you start off with a plant um, which is producing the um, silencing small RNA. So this might be a transgenic plant. So what you do then is to, you, and uh, this is your recipient variety. So this is the gene in which the, uh, the variety in which the gene that is adversely affecting the quality of the product uh, is being overexpressed. And you want to derive a derivative of that line in which you keep all of the other characteristics, but you silence this gene uh, that is having an adverse effect. So you make a graft, and I've illustrated here um, a root to shoot graft, but this is just for um, uh, graphical purposes. So the idea is then, uh, particularly if you've got some leaves on this, um, on this root stock, uh, that the silencing signal uh, will spread across the graft union uh, into the recipient variety, uh, and it will introduce an epigenetic mutation, an epimutation in the meristem, in the um, floral meristem or the shoot meristem um, of these plants. So what one can then do is to remove the rootstock and to graft on then um, a, a wild type uh, a rootstock. So then you've got the plant um, that will have the uh, epimutation introduced into it um, that will be growing normally. And this plant will then set seed. And so in principle, um, uh, those seeds should inherit the epimutation. So you've got now an epigenetically modified plant. Does it work? Does the strategy work? Well, what we thought, you know, I'm, my philosophy in experimentation is always uh, to keep it simple and to go one step at a time. So obviously, um, uh, sexual reproduction, meiosis, is a complication in uh, this whole process because not all epigenetic marks are transmitted through, uh, uh, through meiosis. So what we thought we would do initially is to try it out in uh, vegetatively propagated plants, potato. So we got hold of a transgenic line um, from a Dutch group, um, a Francine Gover's group, and this is a line uh, that is producing a small RNA targeted against the promoter for granule-bound starch synthase. So granule-bound starch synthase um, is an enzyme uh, that affects amylose production rather than amylopectin. So if you knock out granule-bound starch synthase, uh, you affect the ratio of amylose to amylopectin uh, in the tubers. And this is uh, generally seen as being a good thing, um, or it can be useful, uh, because the use of the starch from the potato tubers is affected uh, by the um, ratio of um, amylose to amylopectin. So what I'm going to do is to show you some um, assays of starch grains from uh, potato tubers, uh, and they've been stained with um, Lugol's solution. Uh, so um, when you've got um, weak silencing um, of the, uh, of, of the uh, granule-bound starch synthase, uh, you have grains that stain blue with Lugol's solution. And when you have strong silencing, uh, you have starch granules um, that uh, stain um, uh, brownish, amberish. So this is how you do the experiments, very simple. Uh, you take the genotypes with the transgene silencer, graft them onto a wild-type um, uh, uh, rootstock uh, producing the tubers, and then you have a look at the tubers. So what happens? So this just shows the controls, and again, um, the lighting uh, doesn't show this up particularly well, but I hope what you can see is that these starch, grounds, the starch granules are blue and these are brownish. These are from the wild type genotype of plant, and these are, this is a homograft here, this is the control, this is the transgenic line producing the small RNA, and indeed, as you would expect, um, you're getting the um, uh, suppression of the granule bound starch synthase. This is uh, part of the experimental analysis. So again, this is the control, um, the wild-type plant. This is now um, the wild-type plant uh, as the rootstock, as the source of tubers, but grafted onto the uh, shootstock, uh, producing the small RNA. 
and I hope you can see these starch granules are brown, um, so we've got silencing of the um, granule-bound starch synthase in these tubers. This is an analysis that is uh, reinforced um, by um, RNA analysis here. Uh, so here's the granule-bound starch synthase in the control. This is in the transgenic lines, and then these are in the controls um, uh, grafted onto the transgenics. And in most of these lines, uh, despite the fact that, you know, this is genetically this plant here, um, the level of the um, granule-bound starch synthase is at the level of these transgenic lines. And the methylation of the promoter is also um, as you would um, expect. So this is the assay looking at the proportion of uh, DNA methylation at this promoter, very low in the control line and uh, very high in the transgenic line and very high in the control genotypes that have been grafted onto this transgenic line. So the grafting is transmitting a signal uh, that mediates methylation of the uh, promoter, silencing of the promoter, affecting the phenotype of the plants. So this then is targeted epimutation. Um, so there's some more work to be done on this. I'm sure that we can optimize the delivery method for the silencer RNA. Um, uh, 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 there's probably some work to be done, so identifying factors um, both cis and transacting factors that affect the susceptibility of any one promoter uh, to the epigenetic silencing um, uh, effect. And then there are likely to be uh, factors in the genetic background of the plant that will affect the stability of the silent state. So obviously um, an epimutation is not going to be useful in a practical sense unless it is stable for a long time and under all conditions. And we need to investigate the factors affecting the stability of the silent state. I think there's going to be an interesting um, uh, sort of corollary associated with all of this. So are these plants genetically manipulated? Um, so um, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, what we are planning to do is to put the tubers from this experiment um, out in the field uh, this summer. And I haven't yet decided whether or not I'm going to seek regulatory approval um, for uh, that field trial or whether or not we'll just go ahead and do it. And I suppose it may depend to some extent on whether or not I can get a grower who will actually um, take uh, these seeds and take the risk, but should make an interesting discussion. So. Anyway, I hope uh, what I've done is I've uh, given you a bit of information about uh, what we know about RNA silencing and epigenetics. And I hope I've convinced you as well that there are a lot of questions to be addressed here about the implications of all of this um, for uh, crop improvement. As I say, I think a really important question is to what extent are the phenotypes of plants influenced by epimutations? Obviously, genetic mutations are majorly important, uh, but is uh, let's say 1% um, uh, of the phenotypes, 5% of the phenotypes, 10% of the phenotypes affected by epi epigenetic mutations. If, uh, even if it's only 1%, if that 1% affects a gene that is really important for the um, uh, uh, practical use of that crop, then this is something we need to know about. And also, is it something we can harness through, as I say, um, artificial targeted epimutation? So I should just stop here um, by acknowledging my various colleagues. So um, Attila is brilliant. He's, he's been with me for a long time. Uh, and he's done these grafting experiments. And he worked with Charles on the dissection of the um, RNA silencing signal. Shiva did the, um, uh, the tomato work. And then Chris and Tom um, are still with the group. And Ruth used to be with us, uh, the bioinformatician. So I hope you can understand when you do these uh, Illumina sequencing analyses that the um, uh, analysis of the data is not a trivial undertaking and we've uh, benefited very much from their expertise. So, happy to uh, take questions. Thank you very much.